I'm Matt Zamora. I started uh, here at Michigan State back in 1993. Originally, I came to MSU because I wanted to major in forensic science. And at the time, Michigan State had a forensic science program, undergraduate program. Well, my freshman year, that program ended and they made it a master's program. So that's originally why I came to MSU. That was the original major I wanted to pursue. But over time, um, during my freshman year and sophomore year, I was talking to people about what I wanted to do as, as far as working in a crime lab. And I had a family friend back home uh, who actually worked in a crime lab. And he majored in medical technology, which has now morphed into biomedical laboratory diagnostics program. He said that would be a good major. So I looked into it and I, ironically, had my cousin, I had two cousins actually majoring in medical technology. And uh, they thought it would be a good idea as well because it focuses on lab work um, in case I still wanted to pursue forensic science, which I did at the time. So that's how I chose medical technology as my major. And when I graduated in 1997, I went on to uh, Ascension, it's Ascension now, but it's St. Mary's in Saginaw, Michigan to do my internship. And I had to do a one-year internship. After I completed that, it was 1998, um, they hired me on. So my goal was, you know, we'll see how this goes. I'm gonna try to go work in the crime lab still and see what opportunities may become available uh, <laughs> online. You know, I wanted to really work for the Michigan State Police. And I began to find out it was really hard to get into the Michigan State Police. And forensic science was a very difficult field to kind of break into. You needed to have some experience and whatnot. And so I just told myself, well, what I'm gonna do is keep working in the clinical lab and I'm gonna start taking some classes um, on the side just to kind of gear myself towards forensic science. And at the time, right about that time, there was a show that came out on TV called CSI. I don't even know if it's still on anymore because I don't <laughs> watch that much TV, but it glamorized the whole forensic science uh, career. And they had these fancy labs on TV and everybody wanted to do forensic science at that point. And Michigan State did have the master's program at that time. And I did apply on a whim. I wasn't really prepared to apply, but I applied for this graduate program on a whim to see if I could get in. And I didn't get in. Um, and I didn't think I would when I applied. But at the time, I kept taking uh, some courses. And the courses I was taking was through Michigan State, the lifelong education courses, through uh, the molecular biology, online molecular diagnostics immunodiagnostics. I started taking uh, those courses and I was talking to Dr. Gerlach too. He was my, I would say he's a mentor to me. And I would touch base with him from time to time. And at one point he said, you know, you're accumulating a lot of credits. Um, you may want to consider applying these to something because you're accumulating about graduate level class credits. So I looked into the CLS program and I still had this vision of, yeah, I'm gonna work in a crime lab. Um, so I, I applied, I got in. I uh, talked to Dr. Gerlach about what research opportunities there were. And he had some uh, looking at mutations and the research we did was with ITP. We looked at a mutation to see if it was associated with ITP, the mutation being PTPN22. Um, wanted to see if that would correlate it with ITP patients. And there was DNA analysis involved and whatnot. At the time though, I got to back up a little bit because I was working all these odd hours um, at the hospital. So from 1998 on, I was working third shift. My wife's over here and I'm kind of looking at her to see if I can remember things because I don't remember things very well. Um, but in 1998, I think I started on third shift. And then I was bouncing around between third shift and second shift. And I did that for a number of years till about 2000, I think, the year 2000. They had a weekend only position open up. And the weekend only position, uh, you work every weekend regardless. So I had to work Friday, Saturday, third shift, 7 p.m. to 7.30 in the morning. The caveat with it was I got full benefits and I got paid time and a half for working every weekend. So I jumped on it and it was good opportunity 
opportunity at that point to take the classes I wanted to take and kind of research some things during the week. And, and plus, I did pick up hours during the week in the hospital. And at that time, I was a generalist. So I was working all, all the departments um, except for microbiology. And um, but it freed up that time. So I was able to take these courses. And during that time, um, this is when I was taking classes. My wife got pregnant. Mm -hmm. I started grad school when the same year my son was born. So it was kind of like I was doing things backwards in a sense. But I still had this you know, idea that I wanted to work in the crime lab. And during this time, I had other people suggest things to me like, oh, maybe you should look into PA school. Maybe you should look into medical school. Did you ever think about this? Do you ever think about that? And I was so focused on one thing that I think I let opportunities pass me by. And I could have done other things. And I'd like doing lab work. Um, I always liked the lab. I still work in the lab now. Uh, even as a PA, I still work at St. Mary's on the side every once in a while in the lab, primarily in hematology. But uh, yeah, I, I liked lab. Um, you know, I, in the forensic science things that I really wanted to do, but I think being so focused on that, um, I was a little closed-minded. And, you know, I wanted everything to fall into place. So I'm going to graduate. I'm going to graduate uh, undergrad. I'm going to get my master's degree. I'm going to go work in the crime lab. Like things would just fall into place. And then as you kind of get gain life experience, you realize things aren't linear like that. It, you go down all these roads and paths and things. And so my son was born. I'm going to grad school. I'm working weekend only. Grad school was more of a part-time thing because I, I was pulled between being, you know, family and work. So I was pulled in all these directions. So I was able to complete my master's degree. I think they listed it in 2007. It was actually 2010 I graduated. Um, but I was able to get it done, but it took a good six years of going part-time. And Dr. Gerlach was very patient, thank God. Um, but I learned a lot in grad school. You know, in grad school, it taught me to be independent, really think for myself, research things, read journal articles on my own. Um, and I gained a lot of knowledge as far as st statistical analysis, um, how to design an assay. Um, because uh, my project, it was, okay, this is your project, Matt, figure out where, you know, what primers you need to do your amplification. What are you going to do to show the mutations there? And I had to, you know, get all that stuff together, present it to Dr. Gerlach, and he would look at it. He tested it. I know he tested it on his summer um, molecular diagnostics lab to see if my primers and my setup was actually working uh, to, you know, just to check it to see if it was going to work. And thank God everything worked. But uh, so I did. I was doing that, um, taking the courses, working. And again, I... I keep looking at my wife because I think I was too focused on forensic science and things were passing me by. And then I graduated in 2010, Irana, close to this time of year, it was November 9th, 2010. I went and did my, uh, oh yeah, we had another, we had another baby, <laughs> had my daughter in 2006. So 2004, my son was born, my daughter's born in 2006. I'm going to grad school, I'm working and trying to divide my time up between family. And, you know, there was times she's very patient, but there was times I wasn't present. I was very absent because I was thinking about things like, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to uh, get this done and everything else? Um, yeah, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> like a big piece of information there. So I was living life. And she, you could probably interview her and she could tell you the whole family side of things, how it affected family life and everything else. But I got graduated in 2010 and prior, I wasn't still working week, I worked weekend only up until 2008. And I probably could have um, stayed on weekend only and got done with grad school, school sooner, but my kids were getting older and my son was starting uh, kindergarten and it was like, okay, you, you're not around. You're not going to be around if you stay on this weekend only. They're going to, he's going to be gone all during the week. You're going to be gone on the weekends working. So uh, a day shift position opened up as a generalist in the lab. So I took it and my quality of life was better. You know, I, I was 
not working third shift anymore and doing all these odd shifts. And there was times where I would work a third shift and then go back, work a second and then come back the next day and do a first shift to fill in or something like that. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend that by the way, um, <laughs> when you're young, maybe, but not now, there's no way I can do it now. Uh, so, um, I forgot where I was going with this. Oh, so I took that day oh, shift because, yeah, my quality of life improved quite a bit. But, you know, I still had to complete my master's degree. I wanted to finish it. So I was able to do it and get it done. It took a little bit longer. I did my defense, graduated um, at St. Mary's at the time. We had a new lab director come in, and he really wanted me to become a manager. But there wasn't a management position. He was trying to groom me for management. And a position opened up and then they really encouraged me, you should become a lab manager. You should become a lab manager. And I'm like, I don't know if it's for me because I'm a really hands-on guy. Well, I like doing lab work. That's what I like about being in the lab. I work hematology. I'm on the scope. I like being at the scope. I like running the analyzer. I like working your analysis. So I like all those things. But as a manager, you know, you're sitting at a computer um, doing schedules, budgets, and things like that. And it just... I was hesitant, but I reluctantly I took the position. And honestly, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm being honest, I didn't like it. It was a good, but as I was doing it, I grew to like it a little bit. I had uh, respect for aspects of it, but there were things that I did not like, especially the human resource part of things when you have to write someone up, um, terminate somebody. Um, doing the budgets, working with ho upper hospital administration, saying, you know, you are over FTEs for this pay period. Why is that? Because uh, the, you know, the hospitals, they do these calculations where they have targets for you to meet yearly in the fiscal year. And they set a budget for what the productivity level is going to be. And we would have to go once a month to meet with the COO of the hospital and explain why we were over budget, why we were under budget, what was going on, why were our expenses so high. I didn't like that part of it, but it was good experience because it really told me how the hospital works. And I got to meet with other departments, work with pharmacy on a few projects, especially like with COAG. You know, you have to set a heparin curve to set the reference range for uh, therapeutic APTTs. And um, so you're working with uh, like pharmacy, I'm working with ER to talk about how do we make things more efficient. Uh, working with uh, human resources department when on hiring, who we can get to fill positions and whatnot. And that was that was good. It was good experience. I didn't necessarily like it, but it was good be, uh, again because you got to see how the hospital worked. And Ascension or St. Mary's was is a part of Ascension, and Ascension is this huge hospital organization that's based out of St. Louis. And I think there's, I want to say 125 hospitals. And a lot of the decisions, this is the part that frustrated me though about it. A lot of decisions were made nationwide for their hospital systems. Um, that looked good on, in my mind, they looked good on paper and because they were trying to go, they wanted everything to be uniform, like walking into McDonald's, it's the same hamburger in Ohio as it is in Michigan. Uh, they try to do things like that. I think ideally, yeah, that works, it, uh, but in, on paper it works, but does it really work um, in Saginaw, Michigan compared to Royal Oak? It's a whole different demographic. And, you know, you got to look at what, what demographic of patients you're treating and whatnot. But that, that kind of stuff frustrated me. And uh, again, budget things, that frustrated me spending. Um, but it was a good experience. But during that time, like, I believe my manager, what he was trying to do is he didn't want me to go anywhere else. So he was trying to offer me, he wanted me to take management, um, a management position to keep me around. And he kind of dangled the carrot a little bit. Maybe we'll get uh, a molecular diagnostics department. You can head it. And, and I thought, oh, yeah, that'd be cool. But I, I had the itch already at that time after I graduated in 2010 that I was going to look for something else uh about 2011 ish 
I had some friends tell me, you know, you got your graduate degree, you, you know, your management, anything else that you think about doing? And I was like, no. And one of my friends said, you should go to PA school. And I kind of laughed at him. Um, like, I don't know. And he said, no, no, PA would be good. You'd be really good as a PA, you know. And I got to back up a little bit too. Going into lab, you know, people have this uh, idea that all lab people are introverts and they just want to be in the lab and not deal with people. To a degree, I would say that was me in the beginning. But as I was working, I found out I was more of an extrovert than I was an introvert. And when I would go up to the floors to do, I would did bone marrow biopsies. Uh, I would assist with those. And I found when I went up to the floor, I was really talkative with the patients and wanted to interact. And um, yeah, so I found like, in, uh, yeah, I'm a, I would say a majority of black people are introverts, but I kind of was the oddball. Um, and I would joke around a lot in the lab and people were like, you know, I was kind of the, cl uh, the lab clown, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, when my friend told me about PA school, he's like, you would be good at it. And so I'm like, I don't know. And so I was talking to my wife. She's like, what are you going to do? Because at that point I was thinking, am I going to go on and get my PhD? Am I, uh, if I do, how long is that going to take? Is it going to take another six years? Is it going to take, uh, you know, how long is it going to take? Because the, the, my under or my first graduate degree took so long. And she basically told me, I don't care what you do, but you got to figure it out. And you have one year to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so she could set like a, a deadline. So I talked to my cousin, she that majored in medical technology. And she said that uh, she's, in, she's a doctor now. And I asked her about PA and she said, oh, PA is great. You know, if I, knowing what I know now, I can't, she loves being a doctor. Don't get me wrong. She loves being a physician. She's a surgeon. Um, she says she loves everything about it, but knowing what she knows now, she sometimes wonders if she would have made a different decision. Cause when you go to med school, the commitment, you're away from your family, you give up a lot. And uh, I think her residency was five years. And then she went back and did a fellowship to major in uh, specialize in breast surgery for uh, cancer patients. Um, so when she told me that, I was like, okay, maybe I should really look into PA. So what I did is I went out to Central, took my transcripts from MSU with me, and um, sat down with the admissions director. Cool, cool guy. Name's Clint Fitzpatrick. Really cool dude. That's, I mean, he does, that's the perfect job for him because he's very personal <laughs> and he's got a lot of energy. And he sat me down. He looks at my transcripts and says, oh, yeah, this looks pretty good. But if you want to go to PA school here, you got to take, I think it was six or seven courses. Mm -hmm. Stuff that I took at the beginning, like the, uh, not my, uh, not my, uh, core courses but uh like physics yeah, uh, physics chemistry. uh general chemistry uh statistics and i was like oh yeah and that's just to even apply to make myself a candidate to apply there was no guarantee i would get in so he sat down though and looked at my transcripts and he said well you have your master's degree and you had this high level statistics we're going to waive that we're going to waive general chemistry um, you, you took immunology, which we don't require. So we might be able to waive. I forgot. There was like three courses he waived. And, but I still ended up having to take, uh, I want to say it was five or six courses, general ed credits. And it was anatomy, physiology. I remember that psychology, uh, psychology for children and a couple other ones. I don't remember. Everything kind of is a blur. So I had to do that um, again. Oh, it was biochem. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't take biochem here. It was online. I wanted to take it here, but I couldn't take it because I took it in undergrad and I wasn't allowed to take it again. Oh, really? Yeah. So they said, since you already earned credit uh, back when you were in undergrad, you can't take this course again. So I found a course online at University of New England that was a 400 level biochem course. Took it. Everything was cool, good. It, and I was, no, this didn't happen all in one semester either. This was a course of two years. My goal was to apply and to be in the class of 2014 at Central. And so you're looking at 2012, 2013. I'm trying to take all these courses and get this in. And I'm working full-time day shift at that point. 
um, uh, well, as a manager. And it got to the point, though, where it was too much because I'd be in class. My phone would be ringing from the hospital. They're calling me for, you know, an issue that I had to address because I'm the manager. And I managed not only – I managed hematology, coag, urinalysis, microbiology, and then we had an off-site lab that managed that. And then I was also responsible for about, I think, 40 people. Uh, human resources, human resource wise, meaning I had to take care of their time cards. I had to make sure um, they weren't getting into trouble. I had to make sure the schedules were done. And I learned quickly as a manager, you delegate a lot of things to other people that can get it done for you. I wasn't really, really good at scheduling, but I had somebody that worked with me on the bench. She was really good at it and I delegated it to her and she was willing to do it for me. Um, so that helped out quite a bit. But it got to the point as a manager, I had to step down because I was trying to do these courses and it, it was just too many interruptions and hard to focus. And, you know, the whole time I'm thinking, is this worth it? You know, I'm going through all this. If I apply, am I going to get in? What happens if I don't get in? It's a big waste. And I wasn't paying for a lot of these courses out of pocket, my own pocket, mostly. Mostly it was through Ascension. I was bleeding them for as much money as I could each year to take these classes because they allowed to uh, tuition reimbursement. So I think that's probably why too, uh, number one, I wasn't able to quit my job. I had to work at a family um, and it was expensive to do this. So I had to stretch out some of these courses to pay for them all in order to, uh, again, apply to be a candidate, so to speak. Um, eventually, you know, I got them all done. But I wanted to do 2014. I called the admissions director again. He's like, no, you know, it was about May. He's like, Matt, don't just take the pedal off the gas, you know, slow down a little bit. Just take the last couple of courses you need. Check back with me in the fall. So I did. He's like, okay, you got all these classes done. And we would, I would actually go out there and talk to him. I wouldn't call him on the phone. I, uh, I mean, I would call him on the phone, but for things like this, he would kind of, he was guiding me, you know, telling me what I needed to do. He was very helpful. I still in contact with him today. Um, you know, he looked at my transcripts again and said, are you going to pull the trigger come springtime? So we're talking spring of 2014. That's when the application process opened for PA. And I said, yeah, I just got to take the GRE. He said, take the GRE. When you get it done, call me with, with your scores and then we'll start talking more. And when you apply to PA school, they have this process. I think it's called CASPA. I, I don't remember basically you you fill out all your information you submit it to this program in this in the computer system caspa and then whatever schools you want to apply to you send your uh, application to that school the problem is every pa school wants something different <laughs> so wayne state even though i took microbiology in undergrad managed microbiology they wanted me to retake it uh, Central, I think, wanted me to take the GRE. Some schools didn't want you. You didn't even have to take the GRE. Um, there were, um, like, I don't think anybody required immunology, but that's okay. I think, we should, I don't know if Central switched it. They were talking about making that as part of their uh, requirements mm -hmm. to apply. Um, anyhow, I applied. Before I applied though, Clint kind of sat me down and he said, Matt, you look really good on paper. You most likely are gonna get an interview. Um, it's up to you at that point because everything looks really well. So I remember going to do my interview. It was fall, September, September 19th, 2014. It was a Saturday. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was our anniversary actually. Um, so I remember going there and I was kind of nervous and whatnot. And then I got in there and then um, there was about 35 of us, maybe 33. There was 33 of us. And what they did, the interview process, you know, I was kind of nervous going in, but then I got relaxed and went through it. And it was a, a multi, um, a multiple format type interview. You had to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with multiple people. You had to do uh, sit down with the group and work. Uh, they presented you with a, a question and you had to sit down and kind of work through the problem. And then you had to do an essay portion. And 
I did all that and I did really well. A week later, I didn't hear anything back from Central yet. And I'm like, right, you know, I probably didn't get in or whatever. Um, about another week later, Clint calls me. He says, hey, Matt, what's up? Just like that. I said, <laughs> not much. And he said, um, well, yeah, what's going on? And we shot the breeze for a minute. And he goes, okay, now I'm going to put on my professional hat. Uh, Matt, but Central Michigan, you know, this is this whole formal thing. Oh. Yeah, you've been accepted to PA school. You'll be getting your acceptance letter in the mail, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, cool. And then as soon as I got off the phone with them, I'm thinking, I was like, oh, man. Now I really got to go to peace. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. Shoot. I got to do it now. It, before, you know, it was the what ifs. The what ifs. Am I going to get in? Am I not going to get in? Uh, uh, if I don't get in, I'll just work in the lab still on the bench. It's fine. And that, it's never, too, I, I want to point this out. It's never that I just, like, working the bench or the lab, I just felt like I could do, there was more things that I could do. And I was kind of reaching my potential. Um, my full potential was in the laboratory at that point. And I should point this out though too. One of the, the things that really drove me to go to PA school is when I was a manager, uh, my director called me in his office and we sat down and he says, Matt, what, what do you want to do in five years, 10 years? And I said, and this is, our, he didn't know I was looking at PA at that oh, point. He didn't, know. he didn't know. And I said, I think I want to go to, to be PA school. And he's like, was taken aback a little bit. And he says, you don't want to be lab director? I said, no, I think I want to go to PA school. And then he pointed at me and said, that's the right decision. And he said, uh, for him, he said he'd been in management too long at that point. You know, he was pushing it close to 60 at that point. He was get, thinking about retirement. Mm -hmm. And that, what he was trying to do was set up his succession plan. Like who's going to become lab director when he leaves, which he already had somebody else in mind for it. But he wanted me to know that, that um, eventually, yeah, that could be me or even potentially hospital administration. Because he said, like, but you don't want to be administrator in the hospital. And I said, no, I think I want to go to PA school. And he says, I support whatever you want to do, whatever you need from me. We're going to sit, we'll make it work if you need to take these classes. So this is when I started, about the time I started taking all those classes to apply to PA school. Oh. And he worked with me a lot. Yeah, you go do what you got to do. And then people in the lab, you know, I would have to leave early sometimes. Uh, I got to leave. Can you take care of this for me? Go, you know, they were very supportive of me going to PA school. They were really, I mean, I think kind of just cheering me on more or less. Um, and they, they actually had a lot of support at work, had a lot of support at home. Um, so when I got in and PA school, you know, the first semester, I'll be honest, sucked. <laughs> So going was, back to sitting on the desk is hard. Isn't well, it, it was <laughs> culture. You know, I was used to this comfortable life of going into work at 6, 6.30, getting home 3, 30, 4 o'clock. Um, yeah, I was taking classes, but it was different. It's just different. And the reason why it sucked, that's one reason I, what I say sucked. I mean, it's kind of harsh. But it was hard for me because I had to, I was so used to a routine. And the first semester of PA school was not a routine. It was just kind of chaos, mm -hmm. controlled chaos. Uh, the first class, major class that you took was regional anatomy. So that course is, here's your body. They gave me a cadaver. This is your body for the semester. They give you all your objectives. This is what you're going to do on week one, dissect the body. This is the part. So it's like you're basically doing an autopsy mm -hmm. on this body that people have donated their donated to science. Uh, and so that part, the bodies and things, that didn't, that didn't bother me. That wasn't it. It was the amount of information they were throwing at me with regional anatomy. I took anatomy undergrad. I, you know, I, not here at Michigan State, but before I, had to, uh, before I applied to PA school. And that, that type of anatomy was very different from the anatomy I had at CMU. The anatomy at CMU was regional anatomy, so it was by, you know, region, obviously, the pleural cavity, mm -hmm. um, the spine, whatnot, the brain. Um, you know, you get a body, and they say dissect it, find these nerves, you got to find these nerves and things. And I was used to a model, a plastic model, where they highlight everything yellow, <laughs> blue, red. 
And so when you see something in person, that's a body and you're like, well, people are saying, oh yeah, that's the auxiliary nerve, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, is it? <laughs> I, I didn't know, you know, I just had to take their word. And, and some of these other students that I was taking, uh, that I was in PA school with, were, uh, had done undergraduate anatomy at CMU in the, they had access to cadavers that basically they used the cadavers that the PA students and PT students dissected over the summer that fall for their course. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of them had done their undergraduate anatomy at CMU. So they're very familiar with like how this would go and whatnot. And they were doing really well. And I struggled. I'll be honest, if I'm being transparent, I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety that first semester. I'm like, and I'm questioning myself, some imposter syndrome, maybe like, oh my God, I'm not, I, maybe I'm not have the intelligence that I think I do to do this in my, yeah, you know, it's sort of questioning a lot of things. Uh, you know, I, how, you know, how do these guys know this so well? And I'm just struggling with it. What, what, what's going on? But I got through it. I had actually requested a tutor. Uh, for anatomy because I wasn't doing, I didn't feel, think I was doing well. I was doing okay, but I wasn't doing like everybody else was doing. And I kept comparing myself to everybody else. And I shouldn't have done that. And I put a lot of pressure on myself. And that going, stepping out of a routine and then going back into to school like this, where it's a chaotic thing where you're going in at eight o'clock and leaving at eight o'clock at night mm -hmm. from class uh, every day, you know, I had to readjust to that. So that was one piece of it. And then comparing myself to everyone else, that was a piece of it. So I developed a lot of anxiety uh, from it, but I was able to get through it because I went, if you're ever, you know, one of the things too, you know, the students, if you ever struggle with anything, the best thing to do is go talk to the professors or what they're, you know, they're there to listen and help you. They don't want you to fail. And so I talked to them and they got me a tutor and then come to find out a lot of my other classmates like, oh man, I wish I had a tutor too. Um, you know, they were struggling. They were struggling too. I didn't know this because I thought it was just me, but they, I, talking to not all of them, but talking to some of my classmates, they said, Oh, the first day of that class, I freaked out and had a panic attack looking at what was expected for the first exam. And because some of them were jumping back into it uh, as well. They may have been out of school two years uh, from undergrad, but I got through it. And then after that, so the first semester was regional anatomy, uh, EKG class, things that I wasn't very comfortable with. So that kind of, again, that I think contributed to my anxiety. I didn't know how to read an EKG, uh, but I had friends help me. Right now to this day, I can read an EKG, but I'm not, I can't read it like some of my classmates can that worked in cardiac rehab. They can just look at an EKG and I just don't do enough of them right now. Um, but anyway, I made it through. Second semester was um, medical microbiology. <laughs> yeah, so that kind of falls right into my under, undergraduate. And there was um, scientific basis of medicine, I think, which is, no, not scientific, uh, evidence-based medicine was one course. And basically that is you read all these journal articles and you maybe do a little statistics and uh, we had to do a presentation. Well. That was easy for me, easier. I should say easy. I don't ever, ever want to say PA school was easy, but it was easier for me because when I went to grad school, I had to do my proposal where I had to get up in front of what you talk. I had to do uh, my statistical analysis. I had to read journal articles. So that really helped me for that course. And then um, we started to get into, you know, um, different systems of the body. So renal the renal system um respiratory system and a lot of the stuff i knew from my undergraduate degree i think you know taking being a, a medical technologist or clinical laboratory scientist these courses a lot of its pathophysiology why somebody ends up with this disease or what's this condition how do you test for it you know you, you learn all that in undergrad so when i got to pa school just like oh yeah I would do uh, in my head I'm thinking I would do this test oh this is what's going on and I think it, it, and I used this analogy a couple of weeks ago when we were at the PA um, interactive program 
inter-education program. Um, so the first semester, I felt like I was struggling. Like we were going up a hill and I was moving really slow up this hill trying to get to the top. But then as each semester went on, because of my background, I felt like I just started like going, I was finding my stride and I was going up the hill a little faster. And next thing you know, I was maybe passing some people that initially were doing really well. And um, yeah, I think I, at that point, after that first semester, things, uh, again, I don't want to say it was easy, but it was easier for me because of my experience, mm -hmm. not only my undergraduate experience, but my graduate experience and my life experience working in the lab. So I could kind of, you know, working in the lab too, you, you're, you're getting calls from physicians. They ask you, what tests should I order for, for this? Or you have residents asking you what tests um, would be best for that. We're trying to figure this out. So a lot of that helped me. And um, one of my instructors at CMU told me, he said, I really like it when we have students that have a lab background that are clinical laboratory science or medical technologists because yeah, they know a lot of the pathophysiology and they can look at data and interpret it quickly. And um, he says, it's a really good uh, background to have. And I was like, oh, cool. Um, so that made me feel good, but I got through it. Uh, the first year of PA school is all didactic. After that, uh, the second year is cl clinical rotations. So I got to my clinical rotations and I think, again, it just kind of found my stride, you know, going in, talking to patients. Uh, the first rotation I had was family medicine. Um, so I went to the clinic the first day and it was an odd clinic because it was like right out of the, in the sense that it was, uh, it was in Bay city. Um, and you walk in and, and it's like a time warp from the seventies. Nothing's updated. It's like somebody closed the door and you opened it back up, but it was 1970 something all over again. There was paneling on the wall. It was weird. And then I'm <laughs> like, Oh, this is going to be a weird rotation. But then, uh, as I started seeing patients like, Oh yeah, this is fun. I liked it. You know? And the, my preceptor, he's like, I'm going to show you how to drain this abscess. I'll show you twice. The next one, we get you do it on your own. Mm -hmm. So I'd come in, you know, it's a six or seven week rotation. He would say, oh, there's an abscess in that room. I want you to go drain it after he showed me. There's, I want you to go burn this person's warts off. <laughs> He'd have all these things lined up for me to do. They're like, okay. But he gave me the free, you know, he watched me do it. It's not like I just had free reign to do whatever I want but he would watch what I was doing and stuff. And I gained a lot of uh, experience with him. Uh, it was a, a fun rotation. Um, and then after that, I can't remember what rotation, oh, pediatrics maybe. And I found pediatrics. I like pediatrics. I liked working with kids, but I didn't like working with the parents. Um, <laughs> I'm just being honest. It was, uh, the kids were great, but the parents were like, you're not going to do this from an antibiotic. I'm like, no, I don't want to put your, your four-year-old on steroids. It's not a good idea. Um, so I'm like, yeah, I can't do peds. Uh, not because of the kids. It was just parents. And, 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 you know, I'm a parent, but I get where the parents are coming from. I can understand that. But as a, uh, at the time being a student, a PA student, you know, you, you, you always learn you don't want to harm the patient. You, don't, you want to do what's best. Mm -hmm. And trying to convey that sometimes would be difficult. And even my preceptors trying to convey it to some of the, the parents. Uh, they had difficulty as well. Um, I don't remember the rotation. After. Oh, GYN. OBGYN. That was great. Um, I worked with a physician that I actually know outside of healthcare and it kind of funny how it worked out. They said, Matt, I was, this is when we were in PA school. They said, your, G, your original GYN rotation fell through. Do you, you know, do you got any ideas on who you want to go see or who you can work with? I'm like, yeah, hold on. And we were in class and I called them and he's like, yeah, yeah, just send me the information. And I said, yeah, I got my rotation. And they were all shocked. How'd you do that? And just so happened, I played hockey with this guy. So he took me on and uh, that rotation, I absolutely loved it. But the problem with that is most mid-levels or APPs, PAs are all women. They're not going to hire a, a, mm -hmm. a, a male to work in that field generally, I should mm -hmm. say, for the most part, gener in general. Unless you're a doctor, mm -hmm. you're, all the mid-levels are, are usually women. 
but that I would have, what I liked about that rotation was it was a little bit of office. And then we went to surgery doing various hysterectomies. We would do uh, deliveries, C, uh, C-sections and uh, just various types of surgery and things. Uh, it was great. I liked that one a lot, but I knew that's not m- my fit um, just because of being a male. I mean, it, it probably could have applied, but I think I would have had a really hard time finding a, a, a position. Um, after that, I think uh, we went to internal med. I think it was internal medicine. No, surgery, general surgery. It was general surgery. That was fun. Uh, I did mostly hospital surgery. I didn't go to the office and work with the doctors there. Uh, I, I worked with the surgical team at the hospital. So I would show up. They would We would go through in the morning, look at who was admitted that they had to go see. We would go see them. And then if there were surgeries that the group was doing that day, you could go in and help with the surgery, basically be like the first assist. And they would have you suture and do those things. And that was a fun rotation too, but it's still, I didn't think that was my fit either. Um, then after the surgical rotation was internal medicine and that, you know, you're seeing adult patients, people with chronic illnesses, diabetes, hypertension, along the lines of family med, but maybe they're a little more ill. They need more continued care. So you're seeing them back often. And when I did that rotation, it was you know, internal med people are usually a hospitalist, meaning they just work in the hospital and they cover people's, uh, manage those conditions, the COPD or the diabetes, hypertension, while the pe- people are admitted. Um, so that's that role of it, internal med. And then there's the outpatient role where you're seeing patients in the office, treating them for their conditions and following <clears throat> up with them uh, routinely. And then I found that that rotation I really liked. I enjoyed it. And I liked getting to know patients, talking to them. And then a couple of times I even saw the same. I was there long enough to see some of the same patients back. Mm-hmm. And so I started to think, like, that's the r- r- route I want to go. You know, I think I want to go internal med outpatient. Uh, inpatient internal med or being a hospitalist PA would, would have been good, too. I would have done that. But usually with that position you're working 7 p.m or 7 a.m to 7 p.m or 7 p.m to 7 a.m one of those and you're covering and i had done all that already working weird hours in the lab and i was like i need more of a nine to five now you know i'm tired of working odd hours Mm -hmm. um so i uh, after internal med was my er rotation that was cool i would i would have loved to have done er fast pace um but I don't think it was quite my fit either at that time, just because coming right out of PA school, um, you, you know, you're still pretty green and there's seeing people acutely ill that, you know, what are you going to do for them? They want something done right then. And I don't, I don't know if I would have had the um, confidence, I guess is the right word I'm looking for just to treat them and take care of them. Uh, so I was like, nah, maybe not year. Maybe in the future, and I'm open to it down the road. Who knows? That's the beauty about being a PA. You can you can change disciplines. You might need some additional training, which they'll train you on the job, but you can move around from within uh, specialties uh, uh, as a PA. Um, after that rotation was orthopedics. I was an elective. I did that one. Again, it was somebody else I knew, a friend, a really a good friend, uh, she, uh, orthopedic surgeon, she, um, let me do injections, knee injections, shoulder injections, all kinds of stuff. We did, went to surgery, did knee replacements. Uh, it was, a, that was a fun rotation and I couldn't see myself doing that. Even now I can still see myself doing that. Um, especially with like sport, the sports medicine aspect, um, maybe down the road one day. Um, but eventually I graduated. It was 2000. 17, August, 2017, I graduated. I was looking for a position. I found one in internal med in Bay City at McLaren. It's through McLaren. I'm employed by McLaren Medical Group. I'm a, I'm a contract employee. So I work for McLaren Medical Group. I have a collaborating physician who also works for McLaren Medical Group. And when I was looking for this position, um, 
he was my supervising physician was looking for an APP. He had recently went from private practice to sign on with uh, McLaren Medical Group. And so he needed an APP. I interviewed and they all, like the day I got home, they offered me uh, a position, said they're going to write up a contract. So that, you know, working for a hospital organization, you're usually employed by contract. Mm -hmm. So they offer you a contract for, you know, however long. Mine was three years at the time. Um, right now I'm not working on it. I'm working on a contract month to month because um, you're supposed to be getting me a new one. But, uh, you know, everything about being a PA, I've been doing it now five years. I have, I love being a PA. Um, I have high job satisfaction. Uh, the pay is decent, it's good. I think I get paid pretty well. Um, <clears throat> It's, it's, every day is a little different. Um, yeah, I, I like a, there's a lot of things I like about it. And my lab background really helps me. But the physician I work with, I review all the labs and stuff that he orders. <laughs> he has me do that. So I look at it for him. And he's a busy physician, though. He likes to see a high volume of patients. So he's like, Will you help me out with this? And I, because everything on EMR now you have to go through. And so, yeah, I can take care of that for you. Mm -hmm. um, it's great. I'm on call weekends. I'm, I'm on call. I'm on call essentially 24 seven. I don't just for the clinic, the physician I work with, he rounds at the hospital once every five weeks. He takes hospital call when he's there and he'll take call. Like right now he's taking call for me because he knew I was coming down, but typically I get calls and there are things like I need this uh, medicine refill that never got done. Or I think, should I go to the ER because I'm um, short of breath and, or my blood pressure is really low, those types of things. And they're relatively simple things um, that you can address. Uh, but my biggest thing is I've learned is you want to avoid sending people to the ER all the time. Uh, Cause a lot of patients um, abuse the ER, uh, take advantage uh, of it and then not really, using not using it for what it's meant for mm -hmm. so people go to the er for i've seen some things come through for thing you know like i can't believe they went to the er for this uh i'm just trying to anger on toenail it's like why did you go to the er for that um and then you educate them and when they come in and see you and tell them don't do that just follow up with us let us know we'll take care of it but they still do it anyway <laughs> Uh, so it's that part of my job can be frustrating. Um, but I do find the job very rewarding, but there are, there are stresses and there are things that are frustrating for sure. I think that's with any position. Um, you know, 20 years ago, I would have laughed at you. If you said you're going to be a PA, I would have said no way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it worked out. And I think, um, Maybe if I wasn't so close-minded in the beginning, I, maybe ultimately I would have been a PA sooner. And I would recommend, though, if somebody wants to go to PA school, they do it. Maybe not necessarily right after they graduate, but maybe a couple of years after. Um, I mean, you obviously you can go right after you graduate from undergrad. That that's very doable. Um, but maybe wait two years. I would recommend work two years in in the lab. Uh, get a feel for what you're doing and then maybe go. Cause then you, you gain so much experience working in the hospital, um, you know, working third shift in the hospital. I've seen working blood bank, running blood down to the ER, people getting shot, stabbed. You see all these things mm -hmm. and uh, you, it, you see all, all kinds of, all kinds of stuff really. And um, you just gain so much experience and I would definitely recommend working at least a year but again i'm not saying you can't do it yeah you can it can be done but the people that i've seen come right out of undergrad to pa school in my class um a lot of them did like mission trips they had all this volunteer hours um they were not just on paper good academically they had a lot of volunteer things that they did outside uh, of schoolwork and I think that's what gave them an edge when they applied. For me, it was my life experience, my work experience. That's what gave me an edge when I applied. And when I applied to PA school, they only interviewed 99 of us and they took 33. Um, and I believe at that time they had over 
I want to say close to 500 applicants. And uh, talking to uh, the PA program here, I think they said they had over, I want to say close about 2,000 applicants or something like that, which I was like, oh, wow, that's huge. About 30 now. What's that? Class size was about 30 now, I think. Uh, for Michigan you, State? Yeah. Oh, my class size was 33. And is that, is that must be similar to MSU? The I think she said they had 35, 35, and I think but, she said they're going to keep it at 35 or okay. something. But I don't know, you know, I don't know uh, what MSU's uh, requirements are to apply, though. They're probably different than Central's. Uh, that sounded similar to what you listed. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, honestly, when I come down to MSU, I always feel like I'm at home. I would have rather have gone to MSU for PA school if I, <laughs> if I knew they had a PA program, but at the time they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, when I come down here, I feel like I'm very much at home, especially here in Kedzie and everything, because this is where I spent a lot of my time here in the life science building for my graduate work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm very comfortable here. Um, yeah, I... You know, I, you gave me a little bit of talking points yeah. and things. And I think we maybe went through all. I think I went through all of them, but I did my MLS, MLS background help you? you know, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would it just kind of, everything just kind of lines up with mm -hmm. your medical laboratory science background in medical school, PA school. Mm -hmm. I think it all just gels really well. And I think you, you uh, I don't think people realize that mm -hmm. when they're going through it, but yeah. you, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're getting, uh, looking at tests and when you're running tests, CBCs, for example, or whatever chemistry work, when I'm doing those tests, when I still do it, I'm thinking about, oh, okay, so this person's hemoglobin seven, their RDW is 18, uh, what's going on? And I'm already like painting a picture in my head. I mean, it's very easy. You can get into the habit of just, yeah, that looks good. And you're just hitting a button, <laughs> that looks good. But I'm thinking when I work, and I've always done this since I started in the lab is, trying to figure out what's going on with the person. Oh, you know, the CBC is off. Their platelet counts 40. Uh, did you guys do an LDH in chemistry? What is it? You know, this person have TTP. What's going on here? Um, you know, knowing too, uh, working in the lab uh, in hematology, you have to know when to leave things for pathologists to review it. You see something on the scope, yeah, this is leukemia, but you look at their history in the system. You know, they don't have a previous history. You got to get other people involved to notify, you know, you notify the floor, maybe you get oncology on board. But I think, yeah, MLS is definitely a, a good major. Um, PA school, I think I described that already. And kind of cover, I think I covered everything. I think you covered everything. So there's uh, always this burning quit. Uh, if you don't want to answer, I can clip out from the video. <laughs> What's that? But you, <clears throat> you mentioned about the, the how much they pay. That I know the uh, tuition every year the increase. So PA school is very expensive. I'm sure it was expensive when you went. Just to, it's not long time. Oh ago, uh, yeah, I don't have a problem telling so you. Can, the, to, how much tuition they charge versus how much you make? So. I ended up walking away from PA school. I had to take out student loan. I had all my undergraduate stuff was taken care of when I applied and I didn't have any student loan debt going into PA school, but it was 120,000 for me to go for two years. Um, and that didn't include, I mean, I didn't need room and board and all that. So I took out student loans and I used that for my, uh, that cost of you know, uh, room and board expense. I just used to live off of at home in Saginaw. I commuted from Saginaw to Central every day. Because I had a house, oh, yeah, you know, we had, I had a whole other life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was, uh, I was uh, very much a non-traditional student, but it was 120,000. Um, I ended up taking out 120,000 student loan debt. I still have student loans. I'm making good money though. I'm making headway on my loans. Uh, most TAs, they start out anywhere from 90 to 120,000, depending on what their specialty is. Um, since I've been at McLaren, I've gotten a raise every year since I've been there. Uh, I do, I think I do fairly well, but there's always opportunity for growth too. Um, the reason I hold on to my lab job at Ascension, just I like to get extra money for things, and they, you know, I make pretty good money there as well. I'm at top of the scale because I've been there 20 some years, 20, 24 years. Oh my God, I guess it's been that long. <laughs> 
Um, so I do that on the side, but, uh, you know, as a PA, I, it's not uncommon for some PAs to go work urgent care to make extra money or, or pick up shifts in the ER. Mm -hmm. That would be difficult to do though, I think, because uh, you're going from maybe a clinic environment to the ER. If you're at a whole different hospital organization, you got to learn their EMR and you're bouncing back and forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, uh, one of my friends who is an ER doc told me, he said, some P he's seen PAs make well over $200,000 but they're hustling. Mm -hmm. So they're working in the ER and they're picking up many shifts and they're just, you know, they're getting time and a half and things on top of it. It's, um, but it, it, it can be done. Um, but the ones the typical PAs that make the bigger money are the cardiothoracic uh, surgeon PAs mm -hmm. and um, psychiatry. Oh, no. Yeah. There's not enough psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard, I've heard of, uh, Psychiatry PA is making really good money, mm. but I, you know, I, again, you know, I got to throw this out there. I wanted to go to PA school. If you're thinking about making more, if you want to make money, um, money's nice. It's good, but that can't be your motive motivator to go. I mean, you want to go because you have a passion to do it. Um, for me, I didn't think I had a passion, but then once I started researching it more, I found out, yeah, I think I can really do this. Um, mm but don't do something for the money because mm -hmm. you'll, I call it the golden handcuffs. You'll get the golden handcuffs put on you and you'll like <laughs> your job and you'll be stuck because you're making good money. Mm. You don't want to ever do that. That's if for the undergraduate students. Don't ever do something for money. Uh, make sure you like it. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen too many people take positions for the money and they absolutely hate it. And they oh. get in a position where they can't quit or they feel stuck. So, uh, Definitely don't do it for the money. For me to go to PA school, though, there was a pay increase. Obviously, I had to make it. I couldn't go and make the same amount of money financially. That would have been not financially smart. I had to make more money or else I could, there's no way I could go. And I, researching it, I knew I was going to end up making more money. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, for me, I do pretty well, though. Mm -hmm. um, am I top of the scale? No, but I'm not at the bottom either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Uh, it's a good career. I like it very much. Enjoy it. Uh, one more question: I, the one student asked me to ask you is so the the specialized area. One time you mentioned that workplace usually uh, give them those training for specialized area. Is that all the area, or do they have an like, additional program? There is additional training you can go to. Uh, some PA students choose a residency. Wow. Um, they could, I had one classmate that she did a surgical residency at Duke when she was done for a year, but you can do additional training like that. But then I don't have a problem with that. I think it's great. But, you, you know, if you start doing that where you're getting a cert, uh, like additional uh, fellowship or training, you're kind of painting yourself into a corner, so to speak, I mm -hmm. think, where the beauty of being a PA is you can, you can move around. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I mean, obviously I don't, I could probably go into cardiothoracic surgery if I wanted to, mm -hmm. but it, they would have to train me probably for a good long time. Yeah, yeah. Three months or something to sit down, make sure I'm doing things right mm -hmm. and watch me suture and uh, things like that. But you can move around. Um, it, it, it's easy to do, but I don't think it's seamless. You, it's not a seamless transition. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to obviously pick up some skills and everything mm -hmm. else. But I knew uh, PA when I was doing my rotation, he worked in neurology at one point. He worked ER. He did internal med. Um, what else did he do? Interventional radiology, I think. So he had bounced around yeah. many different things. He had a lot of experience, but he had been a PA for 25 years or mm -hmm. something. So I guess if they see opening, if that's the new area, they more likely train you anyway. Right. If they really like you, I, I think they're going to work with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think... That's another thing of when you're a provider in general, uh, whether you're a medical doctor, a DO, a nurse practitioner, or uh, a PA. Um, my wife actually brought this up to me. PAs and, you know, people think in that amongst their peers, like, oh, you got to be really smart and you have to be um, really know your stuff, which you do. But from the patient perspective, 
you got to be really able to listen and uh, talk to people. And I think patients really want somebody that is going to listen to them <laughs> and, and talk to them and actually answer their questions. And yeah, you got to be smart. Sure. You got to, I don't want to even use the word smart, but you got to know your stuff um, and help them. So yeah, you, you need to have all that strong academic background, but you also need to be personable because mm-hmm. some providers, let's face it, you go and talk to them and they don't, Oh, their bedside manner is weird. I don't like that guy. <laughs> um, that plays into it too. And, you know, I think I'm a pretty nice guy. So uh, hopefully patients like me, I don't know. <laughs> but I try to talk to patients when yeah. I see my patients, I try to actually sit down and have a conversation. Like what's going on? How do you feel today? Tell me, you know, you're diabetic. And uh, tell me how your diabetes is doing. I, I notice in you, I'm an immigrant, so I notice in the US when you visit doctor, you spend 30 minutes waiting room, 20 minutes waiting in the room, and doctor come and talk a few minutes and left. That- so <laughs> my rule as a PA is to spend more time with yeah, patients. So- um, doctors, yes. Okay. So <laughs> the thing about that is, uh, uh, in my mind, a lot of the organizations put criteria. You, we want you to see these many people a day. Um, or, um, you know, they have productivity. Let's, healthcare is a business. They want to, to make sure they're efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think doctors get a lot of pressure. Physicians get a lot of pressure mm-hmm. to see uh, a certain amount of patients. Whereas a PA, I get that to some degree. But my role is to spend more time and answer questions. The physician I work with, him and I will see patients together at times. Um, both of us will come in the room. Patients like, oh, no, I'm in trouble. Mm-hmm. But, it, but it's not like that at all. We, um, If it's somebody I've seen and it, it's, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. Patients rotate between the both of us. They mm-hmm. see both of us in our office. There's some that just see doctor, my, the doctor that I work with. And there's some that just see me. But but the ones that just see me still have to see the collaborating physician at least once a year, just so he can make sure everything's on track. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's sometimes where we go in together to see some of these patients, usually somebody that's got a complicated thing going on mm-hmm. and he'll sit down, like you said, spend five minutes with them. <laughs> da, 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 da. And then he's out the room and then he'll say, okay, Matt, <laughs> like oh, he wants so to you, you continue the, comp- <laughs> continue the visit yeah. for him to, to answer their questions and whatnot. Um, but we, him and I work really well together. So uh, I don't know how, the, if that would even work in some offices. Mm-hmm. I think really, you got to have a really good relationship with your collaborating yeah. physician. But to answer your question, yeah, I, I know that happens often mm-hmm. where physicians, they're in, they're out. Um, but a lot of it is they, they have criteria mm-hmm. and things where you have to see so many patients. Mm-hmm. Um, and they only book it to book 15 minute slots or yeah. something. And um, when somebody comes in, if that multiple, mm-hmm. I even have to do it sometimes if that multiple things going on, I have to say, you're going to have to book another appointment. I can address two of these things really well today, but I can't address everything on this list. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, so they'll book another appointment because that could be, honestly, that could be in there two hours, mm-hmm. depending on some of the stuff people come in with. Mm-hmm. But, you know, other thing, the other thing I wanted to point out about medical laboratory science, um, working in the lab, you know, too, you have to be efficient and, and be able to multitask mm-hmm. and have multiple things going on at once. And I think that played real, plays really well with oh. PA as well, because mm-hmm. you've got multiple things going. I'm thinking about things mm-hmm. and you got to be able to multitask and multitask efficiently and put out high quality work. Mm-hmm. That's to me, that's. A good medical laboratory scientist puts out high quality work, can multitask, and is very efficient. Mm. And so I think it pairs well with PA or any medical uh, provider, you know, MD, NP. Uh, of course, if to be an NP, you got to be a nurse first. But mm. if any of the other MLS students were thinking about med school or anything else. Mm. But I would say, too, don't, don't, um, have a plan, but don't be so rigid with your plan because you may have opportunities pass you by. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of opportunities out there. You just have to be open-minded. Mm-hmm. And things don't 
things don't fall into place. A, B, C, D, E. Mm. It does not happen. That way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a prime example, but yeah. it usually goes A, C, O, back to N, back to B, and you're zigzagging. And, you know, my son always tells me, you should be a doctor. And I'm like, no, <laughs> not, not at this age. Um, your mom would divorce me. Uh. <laughs> But in hindsight, would have I have gone to med school 20 years ago? I don't know. if I, Maybe I would have. I don't know. It's hard to say. I'm glad things worked out the way they did. Um, the only I don't have any regrets. I do sometimes wonder, maybe I should have went to PA school a little bit younger. Um, but I don't regret anything right now. Yeah, I have death from PA school, but who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some of my classmates have. I think some of them were pushing close to $200,000 to that, which is, I, I know student loans is a big topic right now. And um, it's kind of a necessary evil, but you got to plan accordingly how you're going to pay it off. Yeah. Um, my son, he's in, he's at Saginaw Valley and he was thinking about coming to Michigan state, but, you know, we were going to help pay for some of it and whatnot, but we couldn't pay for all of it. And he sat down. He's like, no, for him, he didn't, it didn't, he didn't want to have any debt when he came out. He's going to his life experience too. Yeah. He's sacrificing life experience here, mm -hmm. but he's saving money because he's living at home and going to school there. Mm -hmm. um, it's all, you got to do what's best for you yeah, though. Yeah. I mean, if you want, if you wanted to go to, if he came to us, next week and says i want to go to msu next year we'd be like okay i mean we wouldn't help we wouldn't keep him from it um but he's got his plan mm -hmm. and i told him have a plan but be open-minded oh i guess that's all i got do you have yeah. any other questions no i think after you cover the most of the questions so then probably probably. i don't even know how long i talked yeah we oh, you talked to more than one hour oh did i yes that's a really good video we can make Good. Is there anything? From me? No? Yeah. No? No, no oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very no, much. It's, I think it's 